Welcome. Uh, sir, you asked me to spend a few minutes welcoming you because you've come to realize a dream I've had since 1977. Okay. That someday mathematicians, statistical physicists, neuroscientists would come together and in a clinically relevant way uh, talk together and share the same kind of information. And I think this conference uh, is a wonderful realization of that. And sir, you asked me to share a couple of uh, early uh, memories. I fell into this uh, as a trained psychoanalyst and psychiatrist. I fell into this area by accident. I was working on the kinetics of tyrosine hydroxylase that makes dopamine and norepinephrine. Uh, in rat brain, and uh, we used uh, cofactor tetrahydrobiopterin, which was necessary for the enzyme activity. And we used it in concentrations that made the nice saturation curve, hyperbolic saturation curve, work. And one day I asked uh, one of my postdocs, I wonder what the real concentration of tetrahydrobiopterin is in brain. And uh, no one had a technique at that time. And he developed a double enzyme assay. And damn, if, if we weren't working somewhere 100 times higher than brain levels. So then I said, well, let's look at the enzyme kinetics at this other brain level, at the real brain level. And it started to behave in such a way that I couldn't even understand. It had multiple saturation plateaus. And when I tried to get a time equilibrium, uh, measures over time, it fluctuated wildly, wildly, wildly. Didn't know what to do with this. Um, but by accident, about a week later, I was at a dinner party in New York, and sitting next to me was a fellow who was really knowledgeable about opera and about wine and about everything, and accidentally we got into the discussion of uh, measures in mathematics, and it turns out, of course, that was Mandelbrot. Well, he covered the tablecloth full of discussions. So I took out, uh, I imitated the chaotic curve I got. Oops, I gave away the answer. A chaotic curve I got. And he said, yes. I, I said, those aren't oscillations. They're not regular. They're very irregular. What, what's going on? He says, well, that's a fractal curve. I said, what? He says, yeah, it has about a dimension of uh, 1.6. I said, what does a dimension of 1.6 mean? Well, that started it off, and I sort of abandoned my psychiatry and uh, a Don Quixote trip to Berkeley to talk to Steve Smale. I had a Mike Friedman, uh, who was a Fields Medal winner at UCSD, was tutoring me. I got invited to spend a year and a half in France with René Tom and uh, David Ruel at bifurcation theory. And I was studying and studying, and, uh, and I went to work at the Math Institute to study ergodic theory, and, and Mike Schlesinger, a head of O&R physics, was tutoring me in, in statistical, non-finite variance statistical physics. And I had this rich trove and I returned to my laboratory, which was doing brain amine levels and enzymology and single units and EEG and rat behavior and so forth. And I began to use some of the measures that I had learned about. I went to see Ornstein at Stanford, who said there was only one measure of all complex behavior, and that was entropy. And I asked him, how do you compute that? He said, I have no idea. Anyway, that was in 1977, 78, 79. And it turns out all those different disciplines had time series, and those time series had measures, and it seemed to be a common language, a dynamical language. I remember being at a conference once where we were sitting talking about things of, so, of dynamical sorts, and, and we didn't know what the object of each of our research was about. One was doing neurons, another was doing water waves, and so forth and so on, and I realized there's a language and the important idea was of universality, that there was in the nonlinear systems certain patterns that were 
uh, invariant. So that was about the time I had a program grant. I had an R01, I had a training grant, and they came out, saw what I was doing with the data, and closed me up. Actually said, you better go back to your regular work or you're not gonna get supported. So I had some bad years, a couple of years, didn't know what I was gonna do, was gonna quit. And then by miracle, I get a call and I got a MacArthur grant for five years. And that's the other miracle that happened. And shortly after that, I was working on cardiac interbeat interval with, with uh, Barry Goldberger, who's a student of mine. And darn if we didn't find that healthy hearts were irregular or more irregular and sick hearts were very regular using these measures and in the context of nonlinear dynamics. Anyway, I dreamed of the day that this would happen. Neuroscientists, mathematicians, and clinicians would come together and be useful, make something useful. Well, years passed. As luck would have it, I started to work with Steve Robinson at NIMH, and he has implemented a, a, a program of measures that are clinically significant and has implemented a meaningful interaction of, of these disciplines, and I'm glad he's going to be here to talk about it with all of you who the papers sound so exciting I can hardly wait, wait to read them. If I didn't have a health issue, I would be there. I'm certainly going to study the papers. Uh, but I want to welcome you here. I wish I was with you. I want to thank you very much for coming, and I want you to know that Don Quixote finally, <laughs> finally found it in this wonderful and represented by this wonderful meeting. So have a wonderful meeting, and uh, pretend like I'm on the ceiling watching you and listening and enjoying. Thank you.